Um, so Elon talked about a few things from the past that were great achievements that have been lost, and I wanted to go through a few more of those to reiterate his point that technology automatically degrades. Uh, this thing here that you see is the Lycurgus Cup. Uh, this was a relic uh, found uh, and dated back to the Roman Empire, 300 AD. And it's made of glass, and this glass that it's made of is the world's earliest known nanomaterial. Okay? The color of the glass changes based on how you look at it, like where the light source is. So if you're looking at it standing in front of the glass and the light source is sort of over here with you so that you're seeing it with reflected light, then the goblet is green. But if light is passing through it, uh, the goblet is red. They had this in 300 AD, right? And then the Roman Empire fell, and that knowledge was lost uh, until basically forever. <laughs> um, the way this worked was actually, you know, it got figured out around 1990. Um, the glass is suffused with very small particles of silver and gold. By very small, I mean 50 to 70 nanometers, which is so small you would not be able to see them with a physical microscope. You would require an electron microscope to see these particles, right? But at some point, the Roman Empire fell, and they forgot how to do it. Um, a lot of craftsmanship went into this. Uh, you could see you know, how it's hollowed out on the inside where the little guy's body is to give him more of a purple sheen as opposed to a red in the background. And if you hear people talk about this today or you, or you read up on this, um, they tend to have a dismissive attitude toward it. Like, oh, the stupid Romans didn't understand technology. They probably didn't even know it was silver and gold that made this happen. Uh, it was probably just an accident and they made like five of these, right? Which is complete nonsense. Like anybody who actually builds things as opposed to just writing about them knows you do not get a result this good without a constant process of iteration and refinement. You can imagine there was some initial accident, like maybe somebody wanted to make glass sparkly and they tried to put silver and gold in it, and then they noticed a little bit of discoloration and they said, like, why is that there? And maybe they pursued that, like, what happens when I change the proportions, right? What, how thick should the glass be? Like, engineering results this good takes a long time. And what that means is that in Rome, people were doing something that we would recognize today as material science. And then that was lost. Other stuff happened. Like in the Byzantine Empire, they had flamethrowers, and not like little dinky things. They had giant pressurized vessels in the bellies of ships that shot out a napalm-like substance out of metal tubes that they would use to incinerate neighboring vessels. Um, it was napalm-like in the sense that like, water would not put this fire out. Right? It was a very serious weapon. It was a state secret of the Byzantine Empire. They used it to defend Constantinople over and over again for hundreds of years until one day they couldn't really do that anymore for whatever reason. And this military secret just faded from knowledge. Nobody knows how to do it now. Right? Obviously, we've reinvented flamethrowers, but they're different. Um, this is the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, which is named after an island in uh, Greece where this was found on a sunken ship. It was just a corroded hunk of metal or a number of corroded hunks of metal, but it was very clear uh, when they were originally discovered that gears were involved. And over time, people analyzed this. They realized it's a mechanical calendar that was used to say things like, you know, what, what year is it? What are the phases of the moon? Where are the planets going to be right now? When is the next Olympic Games, right? And people have... Uh, run scans on, on what is left of this and manage to deduce what all the gears were in this mechanism. And it's very different from what I thought. When I first heard news about this, I thought like, oh, they must have had some cute little gear things in Greece. That's surprising. Uh, but let me just show you the scale of the generally agreed upon reconstruction of what this device actually was. That seems like a lot of gears, right? But wait, <laughs> there's more.
So ancient Greece had that, but that is not the picture that we have today of ancient Greece, right? And the thing to realize is you don't just get here from nothing. It's not like one day there weren't any gears and then the next day some guy makes this, right? You need a whole process of science to create something that sophisticated. And we don't know anything about that today, right? All of that was lost. And I could go on and on with examples. There's a whole bunch of things from history that are like this. But we don't have time. I uh, just want to restate that right now we live in a very privileged time uh, where technology has been in a good shape for a long time. We see it getting better. And so we imagine that the natural course of history is that technology always improves and that these moments in history are just like little blips or something that we heard about. But they're not just little blips. It's actually sort of the regular course of world history that great achievements in technology just get completely lost because the civilizations that made those achievements fell or you know, had a sort of a soft fall where they fail to propagate the knowledge into the future, right? Technology goes backward all the time, and not just in ancient history, also in the modern day, right? We lose knowledge all the time. So I'm going to read an excerpt from an interview with Bob Colwell, who was the chief microprocessor architect at Intel for a while. Uh, but this interview is from before that. It was from the booming days of Silicon Valley when he worked at a startup called Multiflow. They were trying to make a very large instruction word processor when that was a new experimental idea. Um, and they were having a lot of problems. Like when you try to design the chip, you're using components from other manufacturers. And he just couldn't get anything to work reliably. And he was like, what, what the hell, right? So he says, um, Rich Lethen and I made a pilgrimage down to Texas Instruments in Richardson, Texas. And we said, as best as we can tell, many of your chips don't work properly. And does this come as a surprise to you? I half expected them to say, what? You're out of your mind. You've done something wrong. Come on, you don't know what you're doing. Go use somebody else's chips. But no, they said, yeah, we know. Let me see your list. And they looked at the list and said, well, here's some more that you don't know about. And by the way, it wasn't just TI. Their parts were no worse than anybody else's. Motorola's were no good. Fairchild's were no good. They all had this problem. And so I asked TI, how did the entire industry fall on its face at the same time? We are killing ourselves trying to work around the shortcomings in your silicon. And the guy said, the first generation of transistor logic was done by the old graybeard guys who really knew what they were doing. The new generation was done by kids who are straight out of school who didn't know to ask what the change in packaging would do to inductive spikes, right? So when you change the voltage in places on a chip, it generates a magnetic field because that's just what happens. And when those fields interact across a chip, bad, it's bad, right? And you know, the new people designing these chips didn't know uh, to take that seriously. Um, and that's why technology degrades, or it's at least one reason, right? It takes a lot of energy and effort to communicate from generation to generation uh, these important things that you need to know in order to do a competent job making the technology. And there are losses in that communication process almost inevitably. And without this generational transfer of knowledge, civilizations can die because the technology that those civilizations depend on degrades and fails. 